today we're looking at uh, waiting for the Messiah. Uh, we won't read through all those, uh, the rest of them, but you'll see we basically start from just before he was born all the way through to his death, his resurrection and his ascension. And uh, this is the, the, the scope of our, of our series that we hope to look at in this, uh, this series of exploring the Bible on the life of Christ. Now, I guess it begs the question, why the life of Christ? Uh, there are many reasons. But I think Jesus gives us one of the, the best ones here when he, in his prayer uh, to his father towards the end of his life, he said, Father, the hour is come. He was uh, getting near to the time when he would be crucified. Glorify thy son, that thy son may also glorify thee, as thou hast given him power over all flesh. And we saw that he was tempted like as we are, and yet he, he never sinned. He crushed the head of the serpent. He wants to share that now with us. He wants to give you eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And then he explains, this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, Jesus' father, and me, Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. And so life eternal is bound up in understanding who Jesus Christ is and who his father is and the relationship between them. And so we hope to look at that in more detail in our in our series uh, with with the life of Christ. Now, of course, in our last two sessions with the promises, we saw how Jesus fulfilled the promises of Genesis three fifteen uh, in destroying um, sin in Himself and providing a means of salvation for the rest of us. And in our the last the fourth series that we looked at last week, Jesus was uh, as the fulfillment of the the son of Abraham uh, and the son of David. He is that King who will sit on the throne of David ruling this world in righteousness, that the kingdom of God is on earth, that land that was promised to Abraham for an eternal possession. And so this life eternal is brought to light then in knowing truly who Jesus Christ is. Now, in this first session, we're going to break it down into these three parts, a nation in darkness, that's the nation to which Jesus came, uh, the leaders of the land, uh, who was, you know, who was there that was interacting with Jesus and the people who, what was the political and the, the spiritual uh, uh, things that were going on in, in the first century uh, that help us to understand who Jesus was. And then we'll talk about why there were four Gospels. Now, here's a little chart. It's not necessarily to scale, uh, but it's blown up here to, to give you an, under, uh, an understanding of, of our Bible. The Old Testament is written in this thousand year period here. Moses, who wrote the first uh, five books of the Bible, uh, is about 1400 BC, and Malachi, the last book of the Bible, uh, is in about 400 BC, and over this time period, uh, the Old Testament was written. We then understand that there are 400 years, we've called them here, 400 years of silence. There's no divine uh, revelation, there's no scriptures being recorded, God is not revealing himself to his people Israel. And then Jesus comes, and there is a 100 year period, the first century in which the entire New Testament was written. Now, this this period of darkness was spoken of in, in Micah chapter three, verse six, where he prophesied, therefore, night shall be unto you, the people of Israel, you shall not have a vision. There would be this time when uh, there would be no open vision. It shall be dark to you. It's like darkness. It's a period of darkness. You shall not divine. The sun shall go down over the prophets and the day shall be dark over them. And, and um, so we have this 400 years of silence and, and, and Micah prophesied of that. Now we've seen this before at the very beginning of, of uh, our Bible. Uh, in the beginning, the Lord God created the heavens and the earth. And it says then, the earth was without form, it, uh, was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And so right at the beginning of creation, there was this darkness and of course, God said, let there be light, and there was light. Um, so, so light pierced this darkness. Um, and in verse four, God saw the light that was good and God divided light from darkness. And, and so we see it again at the beginning of this new period of creation, when he sent his son, there was darkness. There was no open vision. And, and then Jesus was born and, and light shone. He was a light to lighten the Gentiles. Um, Malachi, the, and, uh, the last book of the Old Testament says that there is a son of righteousness, a son of righteousness that will arise uh, with healing in his wings. And, and this is prophetic of the Lord Jesus Christ bursting onto the scene of darkness. And of course, it literally occurred 
in, in about 2000 years ago when Jesus was born, but there's a sense in which it continues. And so this, this passage here in 1 Corinthians 4 verse, uh, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 6 is very helpful. It says, for God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts. So what he did in Genesis chapter 1, what he did in the birth of his son, has to happen again for us. It's shining in our hearts that dark place to give light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So by studying the life of Christ, which we will do, God willing, over the next eight weeks, uh, we are seeing that light and allowing it to shine into our hearts and, and change us and transform us. And why is that important? Well, because without Christ in our life, we're in this, we're in this cycle. Uh, I call it the sin cycle. And so this is speaking, of course, of the nation of Israel, and, and we see it primarily in the book of Judges, where they're serving God, but then they fall into idolatry and sin. Uh, therefore, they're enslaved, and they cry out to God, and God delivers them. And then they serve God, and, and then they, they grow complacent, and it, it repeats. You know, and it, it's the same for us. You know, we, we, we serve God. Um, really, when we see in this, uh, Israel is really symbolic of you and me. And we fall into sin, perhaps we get caught up in things that take us away from God. And, and we're enslaved, you know, we're enslaved to sin. Uh, King sin reigns over us. We're in bondage to sin and death. We're in this cycle. Sin just leads to death. And we cry out to God and he delivers us. And, um, you know, we just keep going around and around. And, and by studying the life of Jesus, which we hope to do, and, and get to know him better, we can break out of this cycle. You know, it's, we've got to, we've got to break the cycle. We, uh, we got to not be caught up in this cycle of the wages of sin is death. We need to look for the gift of God, which is eternal life. It, it breaks this cycle. And of course, Jesus does that. He did it because he was tempted in all his points like as we are and yet without sin. And as we saw in our last series, he crushed that sinful tendency on the head, that serpent-like thinking, the mind of the flesh. He crushed it in the head and broke the cycle. Because then when he died, because he was bruised in the heel, God raised him from the dead because it was not possible that death could, could hold him. So he was raised from the dead. He was given eternal life because of his perfect obedience. And so he broke this cycle. And he says now to us, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. So we can get out of this sin cycle. We can receive the gift of eternal life through Jesus. And so that's why we want to study his life and, and get to know him a little bit better and, and all the, the things that were going on around him. Now, there was an expectation for a Messiah to come. And so in the first century, there, was this, there were those that were waiting for the Messiah. Now, as we've mentioned, uh, it's good to have your Bible open and we encourage you to do so. Uh, the slides will have all the verses that we're going to look at. Um, and likewise, the slides will be available to you um, after the session, as will this recording, which we're pre-recording now. Um, and we also have a set of notes. They're much more detailed than the, the promises notes. They're probably 10 or 15 pages each that give more detail because we can't cover everything we want to in each one of these sessions. Um, so those notes will be available um, after, after the, the, the seminar as well. So uh, look for those things, but by all means, have your Bible open, take notes now, and then hopefully these other um, things can, can supplement. If you wanna watch the video again, if you wanna go over the notes that we've provided, we encourage you to do so. So here in Luke chapter two, Joseph and Mary have brought Jesus to the temple. And it says here in verse 25, and behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the, the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was upon him. So we see here then <clears throat> that uh, he was waiting. He was waiting. And shortly after that, um, another person, a prophetess, Anna, comes in and, and instantly gives thanks when she sees the baby Jesus. And she spake of, of Jesus to all those that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. So we can see that there were people like Simeon and Anna. In fact, Simeon had been told that he wasn't going to die until he saw the Lord's Messiah. And so after, uh, as Jesus and Joseph and Mary departing, he, he, he praises God and said, now you can let me depart in peace, for I have seen your salvation. So how was it that people knew that the time was right? You know, were they just waiting indefinitely or was there some indication that the time was right? Well, we have a prophecy of, of, the, of the Savior coming, an expectation of the Savior in Daniel chapter 9. 
in this famous uh, 70 weeks prophecy. We don't have time to go into, into it in detail. I'd love to spend more time on it. Mm -hmm. um, but it was prophesied by Daniel, who's writing in about 600 BC, that this period of darkness would be broken by the, the coming of a savior. So it says here, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness. So the fulfillment of all these promises that we were looking at, uh, Daniel was given a vision of a period of time in which this would be accomplished. He goes on to say, from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be 68 weeks. And after this shall Messiah be cut off in the midst of the 70th week. So we know that uh, Babylon came down and destroyed Jerusalem. Daniel lived on into the reign of the Persians, and now he's told that there's going to be a command to go forth to rebuild Jerusalem. When that command is given, a clock is going to start, and 490 days or years are going to pass. Let's just do the math here. 70 weeks is 490 days, and in prophetic time, that is 490 years. And so a clock started when the Persian king Cyrus said, go back to Jerusalem and rebuild it. A clock started ticking until this process of salvation would be completed where reconciliation for iniquity and everlasting righteousness would come in, make an end of sins. And it was to do with the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one. And so many, and we believe there were men in Babylon who studied the works of, of Daniel, and some of those men came to Israel when Jesus was born and said, we've come to see the king of the Jews. They knew as as um, students of the works of Daniel, that this time period was coming to an end. Now, just a quick little uh, graph here. Um, as we mentioned, we don't have time to go into detail, but in about 457, the decree to rebuild Jer Jerusalem went forth. And if you count forward 490 years, you come to about AD 34. Now, I think the key is that this prophecy wasn't about the birth of Messiah. That's why, you know, there was some, you know, uncertainty about when it would happen. They couldn't pinpoint it exactly. I think it was talking primarily about his baptism, his death, and then the persecution that would, would follow. So Jesus was baptized um, at about 27 AD. We know the calendar doesn't quite line up. They figure he was born in about, about 4 BC, um, 3 or 4 BC. And so that 69 week period, um, terminated with his baptism, the, the beginning of his ministry, uh, which, which began the process of salvation. Because what did John the Baptist say when he saw Jesus baptized? Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And then this prophecy in Daniel primarily speaks of the Messiah being cut off in the middle of the week. So his, his, um, his uh, ministry was about three and a half years. He was crucified in the middle of it. And then, of course, raised and, and ascended to heaven. And about three and a half years later, you've got the stoning of Stephen, the persecution. You also have the inclusion of uh, the Gentile Cornelius. And so the work of the Acts of the Apostles begins, the, the taking forward of that, of that good news. And so this is why there was an expectation in the time, in the land of Israel, in the time of Jesus' birth, about his coming, because they expected Messiah to come. And of course, it was exactly the right time. God knew the time. And in Galatians 4, we looked at this passage uh, in the promises section that Jesus was supposed to be the son of the woman and the son of God. We see it here. The fullness of time was come. Uh, the, the, the time for the Messiah to come. God sent his forth his son made of a woman made under the law to redeem them that are under the law. And so we have then an expectation for the coming of Messiah when Jesus arrived. Now, at that time, we know the Romans were in power. Just prior to the Romans, uh, after the Persians, came the Romans, of which Alexander the Great is perhaps the most famous. And they took over that, all this part of the world, including the, the, the place of, of Israel, and they had influence over them. And as we've had in this little box here, the Hellenistic or Greek influence on the Jewish religion and culture was immense. And so the Old Testament scripture, the scriptures had been translated into Greek, the, the Septuagint version. And uh, the Greek influence uh, was, 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 was huge. And so we need to understand that. When Jesus is, is speaking to people, they, they would have had Greek influence. Greeks came to see him in the temple and he, he had to, um, in the temple precincts, and, and they had to, uh, he had to address them. And this was all coming together. So we need to understand that. 
Um, but of course, at the time, the Roman Empire was was dominant, and they had a lot of influence, obviously, on the people in Jesus' day. I think most people were hoping a Messiah would come to, to throw off the Roman shackles. They didn't understand that Jesus first had to come with the greater enemy, uh, which was sin. And so he came as a lamb, the lamb of God, to take away the sin of the world. And as we saw in our last class, the fourth week of our Promises series, uh, when Jesus returns, he'll be the lion of the tribe of Judah to sit on David's throne. Uh, so he came first to be that savior, to be that seed of the woman who would crush the serpent's head. When he returns, he will be king and he will sit on David's throne and he'll throw down all opposition. So there was some misunderstanding in, in, uh, in Jesus' day because they certainly wanted the Roman dominance to end. And of course, the likes of um, Caesar Augustus at Christ's birth, um, and Tiberius Caesar at his death, these, these were the Roman overlords and, and the Herods and the Pilots and all the administrators were there in the land of Palestine, the tax collectors, um, and they were hated by the Jews. And that plays into how we understand Jesus. One of his disciples was a former zealot. And so all that was part of the, of the makeup of the people that Jesus was interacting with. Now we're not going to go into great detail. Herod the Great was the, the Herod uh, that was there when Jesus was born, who interacted with the wise men from Babylon, uh, who, who ordered all the children under two years of age in Bethlehem to be destroyed because he was jealous of, of this potential king of the Jews. Um, these were over, all overlords. Um, this is Herod Antipas here who killed John the Baptist. Um, there's one down here uh, who had James killed. And then one down here that Paul defended. So we, there's details in the notes if you're interested in, in, in that. But just understand that these were oppressors. They were installed by the Roman authorities to, to govern the land, the Herods and the Pilots and, and, and those, uh, those uh, individuals who interacted with the people and interacted with Jesus and were part of the culture uh, of Jesus's uh, times. Now, the other types of leaders were the, the, the spiritual leaders. And, and we talked about these uh, last well, I guess it was two, two sessions ago, the third session of the promises that the seed of the, the serpent were these Pharisees and, and scribes. Jesus calls them out. Uh, John the Baptist called them out, you generation of vipers. And uh, here in Matthew 23, Jesus says to these scribes and Pharisees that they were hypocrites. They pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, but they've admitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. He's saying, by all means, keep the law and, and, and do what you need to do there. But you, you've you've missed the big point. You've missed the big picture. He says in another place, you've you've swallowed camels while you strain out gnats. Um, and so judgment or justice and mercy and faith was what they should have been focusing on. And so they were as the seed of the serpent, the antagonists with Jesus, the seed of the woman. And uh, they came into to regular conflict. Basically, the scribes and the Pharisees controlled the synagogues. Um, they had influence over the people by interpreting the law. They were very meticulous about the law. <clears throat> and uh, their power base in Jerusalem was the Sanhedrin, the council of, of 70 men who adjudicated on matters of religious controversy. These were the ones that came. Jesus was brought before, and uh, they, they said he was guilty of, of, of li being liable to death, and they handed him over to the Roman, Romans for crucifixion. Um, so these are the Pharisees. Very, you know, they all wore the right thing and they always looked at, at each other and they, they criticized Jesus for what he was doing and his disciples breaking Sabbaths and, and so on. And, and Jesus had to, to show them that he was the Lord of the Sabbath, that he had come to fulfill the law and that a new era was coming. They had to put the new wine into new wineskins. And uh, of course, that didn't sit well with the Pharisees. They always said, it's not fair, you see, um, because it wasn't done their way. Hope you got the pun there. The other category of religious leaders were these Sadducees, and uh, they were natu natural enemies with the Pharisees, uh, but they had a common enemy in Christ. And so they often bounded together and, and, and tried to get Jesus caught up in his words. And so the Sadducees and the Pharisees worked together um, to, to try to bring down Jesus. And of course, they weren't successful. It really, they, they were successful in having him killed, but they could never answer uh, his questions, and he always answered their questions. Now, their question had to do with uh, resurrection. You remember the story of the woman who had seven husbands, and they thought that just proved you could never have a resurrection. And Jesus had to say to them, you do err because you don't know the scriptures. Mm -hmm. um, so here we see that 
uh, in, the, in the context of this, the, the Sadducees didn't believe in, in the resurrection, nor did they believe in any afterlife. That's why they were sad, you see. I hope you're laughing. Um, but they lived for the day. They lived for the moment. They, they, you know, they were the ones that they had control of the temple and its precincts. They had the, the, the courts there where they were buying and selling and making money because this life was all they had. Um, they didn't believe in angels or spirits or resurrection. And uh, Jesus had to overthrow those tables and, and drive them out and say, you know, this is supposed to be a house of prayer and it's all about business for you. And their power base was in, in, in the priesthood. The high priest was a Sadducee. And uh, so they worked with the Herodians and they, they, they worked with the, the, the Pharisees when necessary to, to overcome Jesus. And this was what Jesus was dealing with in his interaction with the people. And, you know, most of his conflict was with, with these people, the religious leaders of the day. Uh, he has really not much to do with Rome until the very end when he's in front of Pilate, uh, Pontius Pilate. Um, but the real problem was is the religious leaders that were teaching the people wrong doctrines, that, that were leading the people astray and, and were focused on all the wrong things. And, and that's what Jesus came to set right. Now, the gospel accounts, um, you know, what's their purpose? Well, Luke tells us here that he had taken in. Uh, there's, there were others who had taken in hand to set in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed ab ab among us, and that they were eyewitnesses. Now, Luke was not one of the disciples. Now, Luke was a physician. He traveled with Paul. He became a believer, um, and he was a bit of a historian. You'll notice here that he, he searched out eyewitnesses and got the accounts from them and then recorded it. And he was really, it was important to him to write in order, to have things in sequence. And um, the reason is, he says, that you might know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. And he writes to this person, Theophilus, which we believe was a real person, but was maybe speaking also to us as, as lovers of God, which is what Theophilus means. And, and as lovers of God, we want to get to know his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Luke's account was one of the four that allow us to do that. And we'll talk about eyewitnesses in a moment. John, who was a disciple, wrote the Gospel of John, the Epistles of John, and also had the revelation revealed to him. He, write, he says this, speaking of himself, this is the disciple which testified, wrote these things. Um, you know that his testimony is true. I was there. I saw it. I was there from the time of John right through to his ascension and beyond, right until, you know, he's, he's there at the end of the, of, the, of the New Testament writings. John, the beloved disciple. And he says, you, you can trust what I have to say because I, I, I witnessed these things. And then he has this interesting comment. He says, look, if we had written down everything that Jesus did, I suppose that even the world itself would not contain the books. So what was written was for a special purpose. And, and we'll see that in these four gospel accounts. They each had a special purpose and reason for writing. And, and John had his. They didn't try and record everything. It's not really an autobiography in that sense. It's an account of the life of, of the Messiah. Uh, that was their purpose in writing. And just as a little aside here, this, this English word gospel comes really from an Anglo-Saxon Saxon word, God spell. Uh, God means good in the Anglo-Saxon and spell is, is, is news or a story. So it's good news. And that's what we've come to take this to mean. So in Christianity, the term gospel or good news refers to the story of Jesus Christ's birth his death, his resurrection, and his ascension. That's what the gospel is all about. And that certainly is good news. And that's another reason why we are taking the time to, to look more closely at the life of Christ so that we can know that good news and share that good news with others. Now, why are there four gospels? Uh, I'm not gonna go into great detail in this chart. It's in your notes. Uh, and, and I, by all means, encourage you to, to look a little more closely at this, but basically, you get four different perspectives of this of this man, Jesus. Um, there's different audiences who, who the main focus, you know, the Jews or the Romans or the Greeks or, or all people. You, you get this different um, view and, and focus. Um, how, what's the percentage of recorded words of Christ? You know, those red letters. If you have a red letter Bible, different amounts. Old Testament quotes or, or allusions. You can see that... Um, uh, Matthew has a lot of Old Testament quotes. He, he's writing to a Jewish audience and he's connecting them to the Old Testament, to, to Jesus. He's saying this is a fulfillment of, of what's there and so on. Um, and, and then they have a theme. Matthew sees Jesus as, as the king. That's the primary focus. Uh, Mark sees him as, as a suffering servant. 
uh, Jesus as the redeemer of all men, the, the priest, and Jesus as the son of God is in the gospel of John. And, and this picture over here may seem peculiar to you, but this is uh, an artist's rendition of the four faces of, of the cherubim. He didn't try and put them all onto one head. It was hard, it would hard to see, but I have this one. There's four faces of the cherubim, those cherubim that were there right from the beginning in Genesis chapter three, right through uh, to the end of, of the scriptures. And, and they were pointing forward to Jesus uh, because the cherubim represented God's manifestation or the showing of himself. And, and, he, and that's most perfectly seen in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we've got the lion, the ox, the man, and the eagle. And these line up nicely with the four gospel accounts. So Jesus as the king, the, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Jesus as the suffering servant, the, the, the ox, if you will, that suffering servant in Isaiah 53. Um, Jesus is, is, is a man. He was like us, tempted in all his points like as we are, yet without sin. That's why he can be our faithful high priest, because he's a man. He was a man like us. And, and so we, we can um, come to him and, and relate to him. And John, as the eagle, shows Jesus as, as the, the, the son of God and, and the eagle, you know, the, the one that soars above and, and, and sees all that, that visionary. Um, that's Jesus as the son of God. So that's a helpful, helpful way to, to just see the four aspects of Jesus represented by these four gospel accounts. <clears throat> now, the key is that these are eyewitness accounts. And, and, and Peter, he didn't write a gospel, but he did write two epistles, 1 Peter and 2 Peter. He makes this point really strongly. He says in 1 Peter 5, verse 1, The elders which are among you I exhort, whom also an elder, and a witness of the suffering of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. So Peter's saying, I, I saw these things. I was a witness of his sufferings. I was a witness of his, of his glory, both in the transfiguration and in the 40 days that Jesus spent with his disciples after he was raised and in his glorious body. Peter says, we, we saw these things. We know they were true. And uh, in, in the second epistle, he, he says it even more strongly in 2 Peter 1, 16. He says, we haven't followed cunningly devised fables. No Greek mythology here, says Peter. These were real. We made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. I was there on the Mount of Transfiguration. I saw that vision that, that Jesus saw of coming glory. We saw him in his raised state. These are real. These aren't cunningly devised fables. You know, quite often people say, oh, the Bible, that's just a bunch of legend and, and myth. No, says Peter. These were real. This was true. And um, we've got a quote, um, a, a clip here. I just need to change some settings so that this will hopefully um, come through better uh, on the video. I'm going to share my the sound of the video and I'm going to share or optimize it, the clip. So hopefully this will come through. Um, this is from a, a, a movie called God's Not Dead, part two. Um, it's a dramatization, but the individuals in this, it's a, it's a court scene. They've been called as witnesses. One's main name is, is, is Lee Strobel, and he wrote the test case for, or sorry, the, the case for Christ. And the other man is James Warner Wallace, who wrote a, a book called Cold Case Christianity. So they are real men playing themselves in this movie. Um, and just listen carefully to what they say. It's, it's, quite, it's quite good. The clip is about seven minutes long. Um, but I think it's worth taking our time to do so. So let's play that and hopefully you'll be able to hear the sound. Can you state your name and occupation for the court? My name is Lee Strobel. I'm a professor of Christian thought at Houston Baptist University and the author of more than 20 books about Christianity, including the case for Christ. Can you help me prove the existence of Jesus Christ? Absolutely, beyond any reasonable doubt. How so? Actually, this court already affirmed it when we were called into session and the date was given. Our calendar has been split between B.C. and A.D. based on the birth of Jesus, which is quite a feat if he never existed. Beyond that, historian Gary Habermas lists 39 ancient sources for Jesus, from which he enumerates more than 100 reported facts about his life, teachings, crucifixion, and resurrection. In fact, the historical evidence for Jesus' execution is so strong that one of the most famous New Testament scholars in the world, Gerd Ludemann of Germany, said, Jesus' death as a consequence of crucifixion is indisputable. 
Now, there are very few facts in ancient history that a critical historian like Gerd Ludemann will say is indisputable. One of them is the execution of Jesus Christ. Forgive me, but you're a believer, are you not? A Bible-believing Christian? Guilty as charged. So, wouldn't this tend to inflate your estimate of the probability that Jesus existed? No, because we don't need to inflate it. We can reconstruct the basic facts about Jesus just from non-Christian sources outside the Bible. And Gerd Ludemann is an atheist. In other words, we can prove the existence of Jesus solely by using sources that have absolutely no sympathy toward Christianity. As the agnostic historian Bart Ehrman says, Jesus did exist, whether we like it or not. I put it this way, denying the existence of Jesus doesn't make him go away. It merely proves that no amount of evidence will convince you. Thank you. No further questions, Your Honor. Ms. Gain, your witness. No questions, Your Honor. That's lunch. We'll recess until 2 p.m. Would you state your name and experience for the record? My name is James Warner Wallace. I'm a retired homicide detective from Los Angeles County. And are you the author of the book, Cold Case Christianity? Yes, I am. Can you share the subtitle of the book with the court, please? A homicide detective investigates the claims of the Gospels. Would I be correct in saying that your, your duties as a homicide detective include investigating cold case homicides? Yes, that is and was my expertise. Don't most of those cases get solved with DNA evidence? Objection. Leading. And counsel is testifying again, Your Honor. I'll rephrase. How many of your cold cases were solved through the use of DNA evidence? None, not one. That's uh, often popular on TV, but our department has never had the good fortune of solving a cold case with DNA. Well, how do most of these cases get solved? Often by examining eyewitness claims, uh, witness claims that were made many years earlier, even though often our witnesses are now deceased. Forgive my ignorance, Mr. Wallace, but how is that possible? Well, we have a number of techniques that we can use to test the reliability of an eyewitness, including something called forensic statement analysis. That's a discipline where we scrutinize the statements of eyewitnesses and looking at what they choose to minimize, what they choose to emphasize, what they omit altogether, how they expand time or contract time. And when we examine these kinds of eyewitness accounts, we can usually tell who's lying and who's telling the truth and even who the guilty party is. And did you apply this skill set any time outside of your official capacity? Yes, I applied my expertise to the death of Jesus at the hands of the Romans. And I actually looked at the Gospels as I would any other set of forensic statements. Within a matter of months, I determined that the four Gospels, written from different perspectives, contained the eyewitness accounts about the life, ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And did you consider that the four accounts might be part of a conspiracy designed to promote belief in a fledgling faith? Yeah, you have to consider conspiracies when assessing eyewitness accounts. But successful conspiracies typically involve the fewest number of people. It's a lot easier for two people to lie and keep a secret than it is for 20. And that's really the problem with the conspiracy theories related to the apostles in the first century. There are just far too many of them trying to hold this conspiracy for far too long a period of time. And far worse, they're experiencing pressure like no other, unimaginable pressure. Every one of these folks was tortured and died for what they claimed to see, and none of them ever recanted their story. So the idea that um, this is a conspiracy in the first century is just really unreasonable. Instead, what I see in the Gospels, something I call unintended uh, eyewitness support statements. What's an unintended eyewitness support statement? If I can borrow your Bible. Let me uh, go to the Gospel of uh, Matthew for an example of this. I'll start with a passage in which Jesus is in front of uh, Caiaphas at a hearing. It says here, Then they spit in his face and struck him with their fists. Others slapped him and said, Prophesy to us, Christ, who hit you? Now that seems like a very simple request, given that the people who hit him are standing right in front of him. What, this makes no sense. What, why would it be prophecy to be able to tell you who hit you? But it's not until you read Luke that you get an answer to this. He says, the men who were guarding Jesus began mocking and beating him. They blindfolded him and demanded, prophesy, who hit you? So now we know why this was a challenge, because Luke tells us the thing that Matthew left out, that he was actually blindfolded at the time this took place. This is very common, this kind of unintentional eyewitness support that fills in a detail that the first witness left out. After years of scrutinizing these gospels, using the template that I use to determine if an eyewitness is reliable, 
I concluded that the four Gospels in this book contain the reliable accounts of the actual words of Jesus. And that's to include the statements quoted by Miss Wesley in her class. Absolutely. Thank you, detective. Your witness. <clears throat> detective Wallace, I'm not gonna try to match biblical knowledge with you. <laughs> but isn't it true that these gospel accounts vary widely in what they say? That there are numerous discrepancies between these accounts? Absolutely, but that's exactly what we should expect. I don't quite understand that. Well, reliable eyewitness accounts always differ slightly in the way they recall the story. They're coming to it from different geographic perspectives, their history, even where they are located in their room. When I examined the Gospels, I was trying to determine if these were accurate, reliable accounts in spite of any differences that might be between the accounts. Ah, uh, and as a devout Christian, you feel you succeeded? No, oh, Mr. Kane, I think you misunderstand me. When I began this study, I was a devout atheist. I began examining the Gospels as a committed skeptic, not as a believer. You see, I wasn't raised in a Christian environment, although I do think I have an unusually high regard for the value of evidence. I'm not a Christian because I was raised that way or because I hoped it would satisfy some need or accomplish some goal. I'm simply a Christian because it's evidentially true. Ooh. Wow, I hope that you were able to hear that. That's an incredibly powerful um, witness and statement there um, from Lee Strobel, um, the case for Christ, the, the evidence that Christ really did exist. Um, and James Warner Wall Wallace, uh, you know, cold case Christianity. In other words, looking at these gospel accounts. Um, and, and that's really the, the point of why I shared that video with you that, um, can we trust what we're reading? And he says, based on his professional examination as a skeptic, that yes, we can we can trust the gospel accounts. Um, so much so that it converted him. His his study at this strictly from a from from a uh, an evidence based that these are reliable. And if there's discrepancies, they are what he called unintended witness support statements. So a little bit of research here, just for fun, to finish off this first series. There's another one that's in the, the package of notes that we'll send out, um, where you can compare the gospel accounts and get a fuller picture of what's going on. So here's our question. Um, of the sign that was placed above Jesus' cross, uh, what exactly did it say? Um, and so here we have in Matthew 27, uh, they, they, and, and sitting down, they watched him there. This is speaking of the soldiers who crucified him. And set up over his head this his accusation written this is jesus the king of the jews now um what we want to do if we're going to read effectively is compare the other gospel accounts and you may have a bible that has what we call cross references they may be in a side margin like this one maybe in the middle uh, maybe at the, the bottom of the page or after the verse so here we see this little h this is this is jesus the king of the jews um and uh over here this little h gives us these three references, one from each of the gospel accounts. And they're the parallel accounts. Um, and these are, are useful, obviously, to, to check out. So here's the one. Uh, they set up over his head, this, his accusation written, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Uh, Mark said the superscription of his accusation was written over the King of the Jews. So it sounds it's a bit different, similar, but different. Um, Luke the historian gives some interesting information. He says, the superscription was also written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. And it said, this is the king of the Jews. Um, so there we have it. So the Greek influence, that's, that's why it was written in Greek. Latin was the language of the Roman Empire, and that's why it's written in Roman. And of course, Hebrew uh, was the, the Jewish language of the people of the day. And, and so to all nations, to all peoples, the message goes forward this is the king of the jews and um, john reminds us these are actually pilate's words remember pilate who felt frustrated by his interaction with the, the religious leaders who wanted jesus crucified and so he wrote a title and put it on the cross jesus of nazareth the king of the jews and of course the the rulers the pharisees come to us oh don't don't put jesus of nazareth king of the jews put something like well this is a guy who claimed to be the king of the jews um, but Pilate said, what I've written, I've written. It was the only thing he could kind of hold over them at this point. 
So the question is, well, what was actually written? And I think we see here these this unintended witness support statements, because they're all right. You know, Matthew was right. It did say this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. Mark was right, the king of the Jews. Luke, this is the king of the Jews. John, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. So, so probably what was written in Greek and Latin and Hebrew was, this is Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. And so these statements aren't contradictory, they're self-supporting. They just chose to focus on different aspects of it for whatever their reason was in recording. Uh, that's, that's the message or that was the point they were trying to get across at Jesus's um, crucifixion. So hopefully that helps how we can um, put some of this together. And as we just wrap this up and um, give us some, ourselves some hints for gospel reading going forward, and maybe between now and next week, you can start reading through the gospel accounts. Um, there are out there some that have put the, the records together and, and you can read it as, as one, one account. So don't assume strict chronological order. You know, there's times when Matthew groups together a bunch of parables that may have been spoken by Jesus at different times, but he groups them together because he's looking for a theme in those parables. Or maybe there's another recording of a certain number of, of, of miracles that Jesus did. And they happened at different times during his ministry, but one of the writers like Luke has collated them in sequence so you can see a, 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 a sequence of the type of miracle that he did or the, the vast array of miracles that he did. You have to consider the setting and surrounding verses. Always check out the context. That's always effective Bible reading um, is, is to read the context and not take verses out of context. Think about the people to whom Jesus is speaking. Is he speaking to the Pharisees? He speaks very differently to the Pharisees than he does to his disciples or the common people. Quite often he'll speak a parable and then he'll go off privately and interpret the parable to his disciples. But the, the people who heard it originally would have had to search that out for themselves. So who's he speaking to? Is, he, is it an adversarial situation? Is it a situation where he feels compassion? Um, these are all very, very important. Um, of course, the bias of the listeners. You know, when, when we have other people speaking and saying things to Jesus, we'll remember their bias because we can't take their word for necessarily being truth because it's written down. They may be making false accusations of Jesus or about Jesus. Um, so consider who's speaking and what, they, what bias they might have. As we've just seen, we need to look at the accounts in, uh, in, in the other Gospels. Not every event is repeated. Sometimes two, two Gospels have the same event recorded. Sometimes it's unique to that Gospel, but always check those out and by looking at your cross-references and listening for Bible echoes, always a great Bible reading technique. So what did we, what did we learn? Um, the nation of Israel was in darkness after 400 years of prophetic silence. Okay, so there was there was silence. There was there was no open vision for 400 years. And Jesus was that son of righteousness that arose and, and shone and needs to still shine in our dark hearts. The leaders of the land, political and spiritual, came into conflict with Jesus. Um, and that's important to understand who was who's speaking and what's there, you know, what's where are they coming from? Are they coming from a Roman perspective or, or a Jewish perspective? Are they, are they leaders? Are they trying to protect, protect their status and their, you know, their power base? And of course, we've seen that the four gospel accounts give a full and complete picture of the life of Christ. So we need to consider all of them, which we will do, God willing, in the coming weeks. So that was our first uh, session on waiting for the Messiah. Next week, we'll look at the Messiah being born uh, and then so on through the rest of the eight weeks. I hope that's been... Uh, helpful and useful to you. And I look forward to you joining us uh, next time uh, for our week two. And I pray that God will be with you in your study in the coming weeks. And uh, especially that uh, you consider the importance of the life of Christ and how that should change who you are and what you do each day. So until next time, uh, God's blessings be upon you. Thank you very much.